So I'm here today with Sean Oros. So Sean, um, start at the beginning. Uh, tell us what year you graduated and what you studied at Teal. Okay, so I graduated in 2015. Uh, that was my graduating class. My major, what I ended up with was English and history as a double major. And I did both specializations in writing and literature. Um, I actually started as an early childhood education major, but then switched around things because I was looking for something more in higher ed instead. Okay. And once you graduated from Teal, where did you go? I ended up, actually, after that, I went towards a master's program at University of Chicago. So that was actually a really fun adventure because that's a nice school, particularly in history. So that's why I was studying over there. English Renaissance, technically, so I kind of tied the two majors together. Um, the one downside of that was pursuing English Renaissance on the master's level in history is that with the current higher ed setting, there's not exactly a booming job market <laughs> for people to teach English Renaissance. Or as I jokingly put it, we have enough white men teaching about dead white men in the current <laughs> market. So a little bit of a flooded market, uh, low job availability, and I kind of took the skills I learned there and from Teal in particular and applied that into working into higher ed in general then. Great. So once you graduated from Chicago, where did you, what was your next move? Actually, ironically, my next move was coming back to Teal, and I worked as the Dietrich Honors Institute associate for a year there. I was working with Dr. Matt Morgan when he was the director of the now Sheila, uh, Dr. Nowinski, who's in charge there. Correct, yeah. Yeah. So, no, I worked with the honors program. I was basically in charge of our liaison to the admissions department and basically a lot of our events and kind of day to day management. So, it was okay. Matt Morgan and I, and we were kind of a two man show for the whole DHI. <laughs> And then did that position lead to where you're at now, or was there anything in between? No, it pretty much led directly, because then I applied. I found a job out here in the Honors College at Bowling Green State University. And so I followed that, and I'm currently the assistant director for the Honors Learning Community. So basically what I do, I refer to it as a glorified title for event planner in a lot of cases. <laughs> but... Um, I'm basically in charge of a living learning community here at BGSU. We have about 460 students in it all together. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them are part of about 1,000 students in the Honors College. Uh, uh, we do events. We do overnight trips. We do day trips. We do a whole bunch of different things that kind of tie into the learning outcomes for the Honors College and all that kind of higher ed um, criteria and so forth. But yeah. Keeps we also do a lot of academic advising, so that's kind of a newer field that I've been getting involved with and I've really personally enjoyed a lot of. I'm going to go back to something you said, um, glorified event planner. Uh, event planning is really embedded in many things, in many jobs, yeah. and that's always a surprise, I think. Um, Teal's actually trying to get ahead of that a little bit. This past year, uh, they actually started a live events club. Uh, oh, really? which focuses on event planning and advancing an event. Um, yeah. So talk to me a little bit more about that. Um, and had you planned events prior to that, you know, ex accepting your role at Bowling Green? And why do you think that was such a shock? Was that outlined in the job description anywhere? Or tell me about that. Right. So a big part of what I did as the DHI associate was actually event planning. Mm -hmm. So we had symposiums, we had the DHI visit day through admissions, the symposiums was for current students. Um, I planned and helped lead the trips. So we did overnight trips once a semester. We still do that um, yes. as far as I know. Yeah. Um, I did all those different components with that. Um, event planning was kind of a little bit with a interesting transition for me because I was focused much more on the academic side of things originally. But I was also the intern for special events back in the day uh, because we had a student team of workers there and there was a group of us and everyone was fighting over who was in charge or rather they were all fighting and I went to the boss, Sherry, at the time and I was like, I tell you what, they're all fighting. Let's come up with an internship position for me. I'll be in charge and I'll coordinate all the rest of them for you. And then I showed up the next day and I was like, okay, guys, I'm in charge now. I'm the new student coordinator intern. <laughs> and that was kind of my first steps as I forcibly 
threw myself into event planning uh, through that kind of back channel. That has evolved with events uh, through the fraternity, uh, Kappa Sigma, Atil, different yeah. groups. I was a president of seven organizations, I think, by the time I was done at Teal. Not wow. Kind of like at various points in time. Yeah. So I was kind of in that arena. And then Chicago, I got involved in nine different committees in the year that I was there because I didn't like sleep or free time. I finished writing a master's thesis during the funding committee meetings where I was the single grad student representative for allocating the entire $200,000 student event budget for all the university organizations. Something tells me you're just not the average person, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, many have said that before, some positively, <laughs> some in very other connotations, but you know. <laughs> uh, that's pretty cool. So you've kind of, um, in your answers, given away some details. I did want to come back to what uh, what organizations, as you were involved in many, let's do yeah. this, what were probably like your top two or three most influential organizations that you were involved in at Teal as a student? Mm, that's a really good question, actually. I have to honestly go to, first and foremost, I have to go to Kappa Sigma because I was yeah. involved in that. I didn't start to my sophomore year, so I really had a chance to, kind of from that perspective, kind of develop my own persona on campus separate from that ahead of time. Not that with my flagrant personality, that's necessarily a hard thing to do in and of it. <laughs> um, but I was very involved with that. I went through recruitment, or I was recruitment chair as soon as I started, and ended up a scholarship chair from there, and then ended up as president by the end. So I really got a lot of different experiences from just kind of like managing a group and kind of helping craft a common cause from that. So that was a really neat experience for me on that front. I refer to it as my grand social experiment, but um, <laughs> no, it was a fun time. Uh, in addition to all my own plotting and scheming. Um, Sigma Tau Delta, the English Honorary Society was another big one for me actually, because uh, I worked a lot with Dr. Hall on that in particular. I think I was president of that for one, maybe <laughs> two years? I lost track of that, honestly, along the way. But I was also in charge of the literary journal, The Phoenix, and there was a lot of different th things that we did with that, and then kind of just event planning. We did a lot of poetry readings that we organized, because I'd started those in the English club, and then we kind of took that with Sigma Delta out to end English club both. I was also in charge of the English club at another point in time, and we kind of took that and ran with it. Actually, if if I was to pick a third one, it would be English Club because that was the first one I got involved with for leadership. And it was kind of like an entry level, kind of easy approachable one. And I um, staged the coup to take over the presidency um, at the end of my freshman year. And that was a long story, but I, yeah, yeah. Again, not the average. Um, what do you think it is about being a humanities uh you know, major and then going on to study it in grad school gives yeah. you a bit of a competitive edge in the workplace. And what is that edge? If you had to boil that down, um, how do you succeed in the workplace because of your background in the humanities? Ooh, that, I really like that question. Humanities gets a lot of hate in general as far as job <laughs> markets and stuff go. And that's not necessarily fair because humanities teaches you so much more adaptability. Yes. It, you're looking at it and if you're doing humanities right, A, bear in mind the name. I mean, break down the etymology of it. It's about humans at the end of the day and learning to look for people's individualized stories amidst the processes and everything else. Whether you're studying English or history or, the, I mean, those are my arenas, but any of the fields, it should be about the people at the end of the day and learning to look for the people and specifically the individuals within these stories it's so we're so focused on systems and bureaucracies and all these different things that make our life function and our jobs easier but it makes so much of a difference when you actually remember that you're working for people at the end of the day that kind mm -hmm. of service based kind of um work goes a long way it may take a little bit more time and effort out of your day but it can be so much more rewarding and honestly it just makes the world a better place by kind of helping spread that through other people 
that's maybe not a conventional approach to why I study humanities, but I mean, <laughs> learning about those different connections and the values and how to coordinate all that really does go a long way. Good answer. I like that. Um, so what, you know, what do you think made your Teal experience special? Hmm. Having been at a lot of different university settings at this point, whether state, private, what have you, um, I've kind of run the gambit by this point. I would say the community aspect at Teal was what really made a big difference to me. And you're always going to have community aspects, no matter where you go, and you're always going to have different elements of that. Teal's really does stand out in a way with that, where it is so community focused to its core, ideally speaking, mm -hmm. where you have people, whether it be students, the staff, et cetera, people are at Teal largely because that's that kind of setting that they want, especially in the case of staff working there. There's a lot more focus on the dedication and taking the extra time for the students, I think really does make it stand out. A lot of the things that I have carried forward as values uh, for my own professional career are things I learned from Teal employees in particular, who mm -hmm. really took the time and went the extra mile for me as a student, especially as a first generation student coming from all yeah. kinds of different backgrounds. I had a lot of people my first year in particular who took that time to talk with me, to hear my story, to just spend time being essentially with me and giving me a space to talk and mm -hmm. figure things out that really made a huge difference for me down the road. That's awesome. I'm kind of just like thinking about that, you know, cause you and I have some things in common, um, right. kind of where we went after Teal and similar stories and both grew up on the farm. That's right. <laughs> Teaches some <laughs> yeah. work ethic right in and of itself. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about those similarities. So I'm going to ask some fun questions, I think, for a second. Excellent. So talk to me about this quarantine. <laughs> um, what has been uh, your, have you set any goals or anything like that during this time? Um, what's been keeping you sane? What's been keeping me sane? And this is going to or are you not you. sane? <laughs> oh, no, I left my sanity behind years ago. You don't have to worry about losing it if it's already gone. So um, this may sound, this might be a bit different. I've actually found the quarantine and everything to be actually quite exciting. <laughs> it sounds awful, but I thrive in chaos. And like the more up in the air things get thrown, the more excited I feel about it. It's like, ooh, this is a challenge. This is something completely out of the ordinary. So in a way, what's been exciting for me has been really finding the different ways, kind of like making my own position as a conduit at this point towards connecting students and seeing the different yeah. ways they're continuing to stay engaged. I don't even need to necessarily, in this case, create the connections so much as create the space for them to build those connections. Mm -hmm. So I can do my different events and stuff like that online. We can continue with these different kind of forms of engagement, kind of like what you're doing right now. But really, ideally, often with these situations, it's just a matter of giving people the space to make those connections on their own, kind of like you're doing with even connecting alumni and students together. Mm -hmm. That a long way towards essentially taking this and making the most of the situation that we're in. Yeah. In a way, it's kind of nice to have this where we've been forced to boil down to what are the core essentials of what we do as higher ed. Mm -hmm. And it is, at the end of the day, about the education and about the students. And that's what matters. And we're right. kind of hyper-focused on that now. It's an interesting perspective. Again, a little bit. <laughs> Different journey <laughs> gives <laughs> lots of different perspectives. <laughs> so, still on the on the topic of quarantine, what has been your favorite beverage during this quarantine? Ooh. Um, so somewhere along the way, I adopted a black coffee kick, but I've actually been <laughs> down on that for some reason. Um, yeah, I mean, mostly I've been actually drinking water. Good. Yeah, yeah, that makes me sound <laughs> healthier than I am. <laughs> okay, moving into the food side of things, what's been your favorite snack? Oh goodness, I really like sun chips. Okay, what flavor? 
Uh, the cheddar in particular. Yeah, the harvest cheddar. Exactly. Good, it's good really choice. Nice for that. Good choice. I, so that was a nice little detour in our questions, but I'm going to pull us back to um, some more career development focused yeah. questions. So the big thing right now in the uh, job market is talking about soft skills and the importance yes. of them in the workplace. So what soft skills are most important to you and why? Well, I probably already gave away a little bit of this and just kind of my previous rants, especially with the humanities. But for me, empathy has always been a big factor. Mm. I was actually just at a conference for the Great Lakes Regional Student Success Conference up in near Detroit. Um, and before everything went into lockdown, everything got canceled. Yeah. But really there were two keynote speakers, which I thought was really exceptional, especially for a regional conference. And both of them were really focused, hyper-focused even, on the idea of we're in higher ed for the students in general. And like, you can take this and you can apply this broadly, but anyone working in a higher ed in particular, you're there for the students. And it's that empathy and reaching them where they're at, hearing their story, taking the time to care about them, essentially making them feel valued in what is often can feel like a cold and on feeling world. Breaking down those barriers that we have in society goes a long way for so many students who really just need that in some cases. And then they have all the tools to succeed in them already. So that was definitely uh, one of my factors. Um, if I had to pick another, I would probably go with something along the lines of teamwork or something like that in that case, mm -hmm. because I've seen some office environments where sometimes that can be a negative factor. There's lots of different ways towards navigating those in some cases that may not be a problem that you can necessarily fix but just mm -hmm. do what you can in your circumstances do not provoke the situation mm -hmm. further which can be a challenging tightrope because sometimes not provoking the situation further is standing up for yourself and saying something that needs to be said in a professional manner um but really working with that to create a consistent team atmosphere and doing your part towards maintaining that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, take a significant amount of work and even courage in some cases, but can go a long way towards making sure that your own group is applying towards what the goal is. It's kind of like if you're using the farm analogy, you can't work <laughs> on the field if you let your tools get rusty. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, wow, I just lost my train of thought. You, you brought in the farm analogy and it just went, right. <laughs> uh, so speaking about challenges, there we go. Yeah. Um, talk to me about a challenge you faced professionally. This could be from the time you've left Teal until, you know, the time your position now. Um, mm. what was the challenge? How did you overcome it? What were the results? That type of thing. Do you have anything that comes to mind? Mm, well, I can maybe go with two different illustrations for that. Okay. Um, one kind of ties into the last one, so I'll start with that. Um, in my current position, I can have periodic challenges, I'll say, uh, with my supervisor in particular, where we're two very different mindsets. Okay. And that can lead to some friction in some cases. Mm -hmm. I, I've already said, thrive very well in chaos, and I tend to be a little bit of a louder, maybe a slightly bombastic individual in some cases, <laughs> with a lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> some people are not that and do not appreciate that kind of approach. And so while it makes me very popular among the students, um, sometimes it can lead to um, some friction on the professional side of things. Well, not necessarily the professional side of things, specifically uh, with this one individual. And navigating that and trying to do what I can towards trying to negate those friction points where possible, yeah. while standing up for myself, but also trying to learn what I can from the situation. Because if you're in that kind of confrontational situation sometimes, 
it's very easy to shut everything down and basically be like, okay, this is stupid. Like clearly this is the person, you know, there's nothing to learn here. Like there's, mm -hmm. that's the problem. However, I've been able to learn a lot along the way just by trying to navigate the scenario, yes, but also still trying to keep my eyes open for what I can learn from the supervisor in particular as trying to enhance my own skills and uh, really look for where they specialize in different areas and what I can incorporate into my own strategies from that, which has actually helped a lot in a lot of different areas, um, which kind of ties into then with the quarantine and everything, we had a trip with 120 students going to Chicago the yeah. week that all this came crashing down. Yes. We spent the whole week kind of waiting for the final word and creating contingency plans. And mm -hmm. then it finally came. And I spent what was left of the week doing damage control and sending out emails to the students and also trying to refund what was essentially $30,000 plus worth of investment in this wow. trip and thanks to relentless uh negotiation and my uh, aggressively nice policies that i tried to employ with them, i was actually able to negotiate to get either every single penny refunded or pass forward for next year instead nice job so able to have zero loss on the trip at the end of the day yeah uh, yeah, it was a challenge for sure because it was kind of a crisis point, which I really kind of loved personally, and I was just on the game as far as that went. But I was able to kind of apply the lessons I learned and really, um, I wasn't aggressive in the negotiations in that like I was fighting with them for it, but I just kind of looked for common ground. The hostel, for instance, we had $10,000 to be able to stay there for the two nights that we were going to be there. And they were having people cancel left and right. And I basically was able to contact them and say, hey, you know, I know where your situation is. It was a uh, 50% loss, so you'd forfeit one night and get the other night back. And I said, tell you what, keep both nights of revenue. I know you guys are having a lot of cancellations right now. Forward that just to next year, and we'll kind of meet in the middle as far as that goes and kind of find mm -hmm. some common ground to work with for that. So you won't have to refund the money that we've already given and keep that to balance things in the meantime. Yeah. But then we'll just have that in place for the next year and count that as our next day deposit. Yep. And there was some back and forth we had to go and we got the group sales manager to agree to that, but well, to a portion of that and was able to lower it to 20% loss instead. I said, that is great. I very much appreciate all the help you've done. Can I also speak to your manager to see if we can try and increase this a little <laughs> bit more? Ended up the other manager never wanted to speak to me, so I have no idea what stories were passed down the pipeline, but I got an email saying, thank you for your persistence. We have agreed to the 100% refunds. Wow. Yeah. So nice job. I mean, had you not taken that time and put that energy into it, that outcome probably would not have been achieved. Exactly. And then that would have negatively impacted the students because we're not funded by a grant like the DHI is. We're funded basically yeah. by student fees that go into the program. So that gotcha. would have been a direct loss, basically. Well, there's some university funding that goes into us, too. But that would have basically been a direct loss of their money. It would have affected things so much more in the long run. Yeah, we are very, very um, fortunate to have the Dietrich fund oh, yeah. at Teal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's very nice. Um, and the amount that was given to Teal over other colleges is also different. That's my understanding. It's very significant, quite frankly. There's a lot of schools. A lot of schools got more in some ways, but proportionately, I mean, right. based on size wise, ours was very, I mean, it was already significant in comparison to the others, but it's tremendously significant when you look at that grand scheme. And I was actually a freshman when that gift was announced in the first place. And I basically immediately, I went to Italy, I went to Greece, and I went to London and Paris thanks to that grant. That's awesome. Yeah. There's some places you just listed I'd like to go. <laughs> but oh not goodness. anytime soon. Just not soon. Italy right now. Just, just not yeah, Italy right now. Not right now. No. So I want you to think back to your senior year. Uh, oh, yes. And... Um, when were you applying to grad schools or did you start that uh, earlier 
Um, no, I did not start earlier. Starting <laughs> earlier is the responsible thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> Most of my lessons I pass on to students are along the lines of, yeah, I was stupid. Don't be me. Think ahead. But you did go to, you know, Chicago and I went to Yale, so. You know, you can pull <laughs> things out of the hat and adrenaline is a wonderful thing in some cases. <laughs> Yep. Um, what I've told students in particular, some of the lessons that I learned was, A, just kind of do your research ahead of time. Like Chicago and Yale obviously stand out just kind of on their own merits. So yeah. both easy ones to uh, think of and go for. But there's a lot of other programs all around in your areas that can have yes. a lot of really hidden gems of programs. And even sometimes the elite schools, I mean, for as much credit as they get and as fantastic as they are, like, oh my goodness, I loved every second that I was at Chicago. Um, and there's still a lot of barriers to overcome, especially in these elite settings. Sometimes you can find a lot of my aforementioned values of empathy and so forth really lacking in comparison to uh, mm -hmm. what still stand out on that front. Mm -hmm. individuals who went tremendous ways towards making my experience a good time but it's not necessarily the same arena so that's something to bear in mind so looking around mm -hmm. at the elite schools that's absolutely an option to go for um, but there's hidden gems all across the country one thing that I was actually told was to apply to a broad geographic area whether you're intending to go or not because that actually makes you just look more competitive from a cursory glance and it's all about getting those next stages. Another thing, for instance, especially if you're kind of a hybrid like myself, where I was looking at English and history programs, I applied to an English and a history program at OSU. Found out you don't do that because then both departments turn you down because think, oh, the other one will take you. This is actually something I learned from the people in my grad program who were kind of prepping everyone to go towards like top 15 grad schools in the country, mm -hmm. or programs in the country, because they were all about my master's program was all about your results afterwards to help make them look additionally um, good as a showpiece, as far as it goes. They did Outcomes all the work in tracking the metrics. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so there's like very simple tips and tricks like that that you might not think of, but yeah. really do go a long way. But honestly, the biggest thing is your writing sample as a humanities or social science major is going to be. 60% of your application. That's going to be so much that you stand on as far as that goes. Thankfully, we have professors at Teal who take the time to really help you craft those, but it's not a bad idea to maybe even sit down with the same professor or maybe somebody else from a different perspective to go over that again and help make sure you polish that um, if you're sending that out to grad schools in particular. I think really that's what it comes down to. Like if you're applying to schools, just kind of do some research ahead of time. Bear in mind those different things as far as the actual politics of grad school go for applications, geographic range, um, mm -hmm. applying to too many in one central area, kind of pick and choose mm -hmm. in some cases. Don't be afraid to apply to eight or above as far as that goes. I did six, I got into half of those and I got denied by half of those, two of which was OSU, so I mean. <laughs> Two denies one school. I, I one bird, two no wait, two birds, one stone. Yeah, regardless. But yeah. <laughs> so there's definitely some lessons to be learned from that. Sure. As far as it, but it all works out. Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna ask you just a couple of fun teal questions. What's your favorite space at Teal? Whether it was like a favorite study space or just your favorite space overall, what was your favorite space at Teal? Wow, locationally speaking, one of my best years was actually sophomore year when I was an RA in Sawhill. So I actually had a lot of fond memories about Sawhill. We had a really good, we called it the Sawhill Lobby Crew actually, but we had a lot of people. It was very, a fantastic community in that building at the time. Um, that always stands out in my memories of locations. Not necessarily an area I would hang out around other than being a resident there. Greenville Hall, I always enjoyed that setting, but maybe it was the English and history person in me as I spent so much time there. 
Wires Lounge. I did a lot of events and different things in that space. There's some nooks and crannies um, in the library and even yes. in the upper levels of, um, well, what would be called Livingston uh, suites or whatnot, but kind of mm -hmm. the upper levels to my see where above uh, where all the offices are. There's some interesting study spots to track down. I don't know. I mean, I spent a lot of time exploring a lot of different locations on Teal. I probably ended up in more basements and rooftops than <laughs> better to talk about now. But regardless. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, the locations on Teal, actually, if I had to pick one spot, I mean, the woods behind Teal. There's a lot of different trails and stuff behind Teal that really have some neat locations back there as well. Huh, didn't know that. Oh yeah, um, I explored a lot. What was your favorite thing to eat when you were at Teal? I mean, I really, really loved AVI's pork chops, honestly. <laughs> strange to pick that out specifically. But the one thing that stands out for my dining experience in general was there was, it definitely wasn't black coffee at the time. But I had this regular routine that I went, and uh, the ladies at the bistro, I got along with great. And Carol, in particular, was there. Shout out to Carol at the bistro. Exactly. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Amazing. Um, but she always remembered exactly what I wanted. And I used to get a coffee with the white chocolate syrup in it. However, she further spoiled me because every time she saw me coming, she would get it ready from just seeing me in line or approaching. And would also add steamed milk to it. Oh. In the freshman 15 or even sophomore year, but junior year when I became dependent on coffee and caffeine, oh boy, those every day began to add on some pounds to me. <laughs> <That's the laughs> but it became known as the Sean Oris special to the point that one of my professors, Jared Johnson, would <laughs> and ask for the Sean or a special and we don't have to explain anything further and Carol will just get that ready for him. <laughs> oh we're gonna have to bring that back I think. Right? I mean it was tasty. I'm not gonna deny. That's good. Yeah. So we covered um, some interesting territory and I think our students will be so happy to hear from you but you know if you had uh, to give them kind of any last thoughts or any last words you know mm. everybody is experiencing this time differently and you seem to have a pretty optimistic um, view on things but for many students you know they're sad they had to leave the college and go home right now right. and um, some are seniors and are preparing to get out into the world and um, find a job so just any last words for our students one thing about life and I mean as a history major I've seen this play out in so many different settings throughout history we're living through history right now. Mm -hmm. How we act is going to define how that story gets told, essentially. I would say, bear in mind, that in addition to the national story and everything else, that we all have our own individual stories. And these are what we're going to have to tell down the road. In that mindset, do what you can to try to help First of all, the greater good. Like, this is a difficult time. There's a lot of personal sacrifices that have to be made. I feel bad for graduating seniors in particular. This is an awful yeah. time for this to come down the road for them. But really for everyone. For me, college was a very important time and had a lot of things that I could hold on to that gave me space to be myself. Losing that would be challenging, especially not really being able to necessarily even stay on campus and that. I would say if you had one thing in particular to say is, yeah, keep your head up. I mean, this won't be over soon, I imagine. There's lots more challenges down the road. We don't know how things will develop, but just always look for how you can do that little bit of good, which will be A, fulfilling yourself, and B, help us come together as a people even globally at this point in time and form that community because that's you can't control your circumstances but you can control how you react to them yeah um if any of our students 
wanted to chat with you or reach oh, out absolutely. to you, would you be available? Um, oh, and absolutely. what would be the best way for them to reach you? Best way to reach me is typically email. Um, actually, my Gmail is still modeled on my old Teal uh, email address. So it's uh, Soros754, S-O-R-O-S, 754 at gmail.com. I'd be happy to chat with anyone through there. And if we wanted to set up, like if people wanted to talk in some kind of, I'm a very interpersonal individual, so mm -hmm. I love like the video chats to that process of that you can actually see somebody's face and kind of read a little bit more emotion. That yeah. Way. I'd be yeah. happy to set that up, um, set up phone calls, what have you. I'm always more than happy to talk if you haven't caught on. <laughs> Cool. Um, so I do want to uh, thank the um, alumni relations office for kind of coming up with this idea and the advancement office mm -hmm. and they they kind of generated this idea and then I was like, you know what, I think I'm going to try to get, you know, some alumni talking like ASAP. So I really thank you for your time. Absolutely. And I, I think our students will like hearing from you, like I said. So um, that's it for now, and everybody has your information and knows how to reach out to you. So we'll end it there. Excellent. Sounds good. I appreciate it.